It's good to see everyone out this morning. If you would open up your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 3. We will begin here in just a moment. I think it's important to give a disclaimer. Um, I am not a full-time preacher, sort of like a substitute. I fill in every once in a while. I'm sure everybody remembers whenever they were in school and they would have a substitute. A substitute is not as good as the real teacher. Um, so I hope you don't expect a whole lot. But the good news is, is uh, we have a book, and uh, that book is the Bible. And it was uh, written by men and inspired by God. Um, so we're fortunate from that regard. I was here many years ago and uh, brought a lesson. I'm not going to ask anybody to raise their hand if they remember, if you even hear um, what I preached. I probably won't remember myself. But um, I do want to share a, a little story that I came across at some point. Um, and it was about two men that were sitting around having a conversation. Uh, they'd been friends for a long time. And one of the men said, I think I've decided I'm going to stop attending church services. And the other man said, why in the world would you do that? And he said, well, you know, I've been going for many, many, many years. And as I sit here today, I can't recall one lesson that was presented to me. Uh, so the other man said, well, hmm, you know, I've been married for 45 years. And as I sit here, I cannot remember one meal that my wife prepared for me. Yet that meal sustained my life. It was nourishing. Um, and it brought me up into this point today. And just listening to that story, it sounds pretty cute. It sounds inspiring. Um, but uh, I thought about it for quite a while, and I've added something to that story. Suppose you have a, an illness or a medical issue, and you have to go to uh, have a surgery. And the doctor comes in, and he says... <laughs> How you doing? You know, I went to medical school for eight years, and I don't remember any of the lessons, but I was there, and I absorbed the thing, so maybe this will go well. Um, so the moral of the story is, is, you know, whenever we hear these lessons, we may not remember everything about them, but we do need to pay attention. We need to take them with us. We need to continue to study and think about the things that were presented, and most impor importantly, we need to apply those truths to our life. So Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 is where we'll begin. Ironically, in class this morning, obviously, you guys are starting in Romans. Um, one thing that I'll tell you that's always interesting to me, and it was told to me in a class in Romans, is the first 11 chapters of uh, Romans, you will not find one command in there. Um, it's basically exhortation. Um, it's, it's setting up for that first command in Romans chapter 12. So as you guys go through that, remember that and um, pay attention to the first 11 chapters. Uh, basically, it's giving a, a reasoning for the commands that come in the second part of the book. But Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, For all sin and fall short of the glory of God. I don't have to ask anybody this morning to raise their hand if they've ever been tempted. Because this passage tells us that everybody has sinned. And we know that before sin comes temptation. Temptation uh, comes to us as a choice. Uh, it is our last opportunity to escape, so to speak, before we actually commit sin. And if you'll flip over a couple of chapters to Romans chapter 6, verse 23. We all understand the consequences of sin. Verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Obviously, we're here this morning. No one wants to face that death, that eternal death. We want eternal life in Christ Jesus. So what we'll be looking at uh, this morning is temptation um, and, 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 and hopefully how to overcome that temptation, how to slow down and think when we're presented with that temptation. Now, if you would turn over to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it's where we'll be spending the majority of our time. And we'll read verse 13 so many times that you'll probably get tired of hearing it by the time we get done. Um, but looking at the first 11 verses, 
uh, Paul is reminding the audience of the Israelites and their escape from Egypt as they journeyed to the promised land. One of the things that he mentions specifically is the sin that kept popping up as they went on that journey. He specifically mentions idolatry, sexual immorality, testing the Lord, and murmuring. Consequently, we, re we read these individuals caught up in these things died, and that death was a physical death. We talked about in class this morning that death. That was not a, a physical death, but this here, uh, when we're talking about the events of the children of Israel, that was a physical death. Um, so, as we are studying this morning, we need to think of our spiritual life, as we talked about in our class. And uh, I have here that this is a life or death situation. And obviously, um, we're referring to a spiritual life or death situation. Continuing in the context of the Israelites, more and more began depending on themselves rather than God. You know, we also talked about serving creation rather than the creator. And that can be so many things. The illustration was given of fishing. I mean, there are so many things. It doesn't necessarily have to be, as another illustration was, to, to worship the trees uh, and, and the ground and, and Mother Earth and all of these things that some people do. Um, it can be anything that's self-service. Verse 12 of uh, uh, chapter 10 here says, therefore, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. We have to ask ourselves, what is that there for? I'm sure you guys have heard that before. Um, and he's looking back to the children of Israel over and over as they forgot about God. They thought that they were standing alone. If we go through life thinking we are standing alone, attempting to guide our own steps, we will fail. Paul's aim here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is for the hearers to understand that God is our advocate and he's given us some amazing provisions to assist us. Our pool verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So what we're going to do is we're going to break this passage down. I believe there's four points that we'll be making um, in, in verse 13 as we go through here. The first is we need to realize is that we, uh, what we face is common, as this passage says. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Paul says the temptation that we face is common. There's nothing new. We all face temptations in the same way. Uh, 1 John chapter 2 talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those three things. That's it. They've been around since the beginning of time. If we go back to uh, Genesis chapter 3, uh, starting in the sixth verse or about. Um, and, and, and sometimes we say, you know, God created the world in, in Genesis chapter 1, and it only took three chapters for everything to sort of fall apart and for evil to take over the thoughts and intentions of man. So this is right after creation in the garden. Eve was deceived by Satan, and Adam went along as well. All three aspects are there. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. There are other uh, examples. We think back to 2 Samuel uh, chapter 11 with uh, David and Bathsheba. David looked upon Bathsheba. There is where the temptation began. It wasn't a sin seeing her. You know, he was up on his rooftop and he saw her. Um, some point while he was there, temptation crept in. And he allowed his, his, his mind to think on these things. Um, and that's whenever sin took hold. At uh, some point while seeing, uh, he devised the plan to bring Uriah the Hittite, her husband, home from war, thinking he would go home and lie with Bathsheba, and he didn't because we know what happened in that situation. And then you had one sin leading to another, to another, to another, and this whole situation snowballed, which ultimately David had Uriah carry his own death sentence to Joab, the pride of life. You know, all of those things. If you would turn over to Hebrews chapter 4, 
Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus faced all of these things as well. Um, and he was able to overcome these things. He didn't sin. Um, one of those is well documented in both uh, Matthew, Luke, uh, as well as mentioned in Mark when Satan um, tempted Jesus. And, you know, you can recall what he said every time is, it is written, it is written, it is written. He did not give in to that temptation that was presented. Common. We're going to look at this word again, common. We can't look at God and say, wasn't expecting that. Paul says that we should have because it's common. It's common to all men. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9 will not turn over there but it says there is nothing new under the sun Satan does not have any new tricks he doesn't need any new tricks he's very good at using the ones that he has um, we need to realize that other people have faced and overcome these same things that should give us strength you know I've always been the type of person to look at somebody else and say, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. And that's the way that we should be. All men have faced these same uh, tricks of Satan. It's all common to man, and individuals have overcome. You know, Hebrews 4, 15, we just looked at. Jesus suffered or um, what, what was tempted in the same way that we are, and he overcame. Um, and we need to do the same thing. Point number two, we, re we need to remember that God is faithful. Back to 10 and 13 of 1 Corinthians. No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful. We see this theme throughout the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 7 and verse 9. As Moses is addressing the children of Israel, he said, God is faithful. 1 Corinthians 1 and 9, God is faithful. 2 Corinthians 1 18, but God is faithful along with a host of other verses. I don't think I need to convince anyone here this morning that God is faithful. We also read in Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, if you would turn over there. <clears throat> Titus chapter 1 and verse 2. And hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. God cannot lie. We need to realize that when we are tempted, God is faithful. God is there. He hasn't left. He hasn't abandoned us. He hasn't thrown us to the wolves. If anybody does those things, who is it? It's us. It's we're the ones that abandon God. We're the ones that turn our back. But God has never left. Uh, think back of, of Job and uh, what all he went through. Um, and he was able to overcome. Just because we feel something doesn't mean it's true. Remember when Joseph's brothers returned to their father in Genesis chapter 37 with Joseph, Joseph's tunic when they had dipped it in blood? And in verse 33 of, of chapter 37 in Genesis, Jacob says, without a doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. He believed it. He felt that way. He mourned for his son for many days. But guess what? He was wrong. We may feel that God has left us in times of trial and temptation, but he's still right there. Just because we feel that way doesn't mean that is the case. Going back to the context of uh, chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, Paul is talking about the children of Israel as we discussed. He says when your fathers got in trouble, it's because they turned their back on God. They decided that God wasn't with them anymore. You know, they had uh, different expectations of what that should look like. Uh, so they decided to make those provisions themselves, and obviously it got them into trouble. <coughs> um, one instance is uh, in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 1. Uh, whenever they decided at the base of Mount Sinai uh, that they needed to create a God. They asked uh, Aaron to uh, make them a God. So what they do, they took all of their gold, their earrings, and they melted it down, and they made a golden calf and proclaimed that this was now their God. 
How unbelievable. After all that God did, they witnessed these things with their own eyes. They forgot about God. He never left them. God is faithful. When we are tempted, we need to remember that. Um, that, that God has told us that he is faithful and God has told us that he cannot lie. And we trust and believe those things. Number three, the next thing that God tells us through Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13 is we need to realize that you are able. <clears throat> no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. You and I can never raise a defiant fist at God and say, I couldn't resist. I just couldn't resist. The situation that I'm in this temptation that was presented, it just physically was impossible for me to resist. We can't say that. Paul says God, because of his faithfulness, isn't going to let you encounter more than what you can bear. We are stronger than what we think we are. How many people have heard, the devil made me do it? You know, that's an excuse that folks... Um, use a lot, hopefully kids more than um, adults, but I think that uh, unfortunately may not be true. Um, when it comes to auto accidents, now it's been many years, I used to be an auto adjuster, and I'm glad that I'm no longer an auto adjuster, but the state of Florida was a comparative negligent state. Um, a lot of folks outside of the insurance industry always say, well, Florida's a no fault, so it doesn't matter if I hit somebody, I'm not at fault. That's certainly not the case. That's only for medical. And I'm not trying to give an insurance speech up here. Um, but I, I, I use this as an example because it's something that I'm familiar with. Um, when it comes to auto accidents, comparative negligence means that you can share responsibility in an accident. If you contributed, then you could be 25%. And I think the law has changed a couple of years ago. It's now a, a different where it's maybe 51% or what have you. Um, but, you know, one of the questions that we would always ask is, is, you know, what happened? And did you have a last clear chance to avoid the accident? Meaning if somebody ran a red light, and you saw them, but you didn't hit your brakes because you said they ran the red light, I've got a green light, I'm just gonna hit them anyway, you have some responsibility. You know, you, you have an obligation to avoid that accident. So in, in, in matters such as this, as we're talking this morning, the devil may tempt us, but we have that last clear chance and last opportunity to avoid allowing sin to, to be made manifest in our lives. We have a choice. The best thing we can do when we are tempted is to just stop. You know, I'm sure that a lot of you growing up heard from your parents to just stop and count to 10 before maybe saying something or before doing something. And there's so much wisdom in that. Um, because so many times when we're tempted, hastily we just move forward and uh, uh, we allow sin to be made manifest rather than just stopping, thinking about, the physical ramifications and consequences, let alone the spiritual consequences of sin. Every time we sin, it is because we chose to. I know we don't like to think about that, but sin is a choice. I have a, another story or illustration. It's uh, about a frog and a scorpion that were on sort of a small island on a river and it had been raining, and the, the river was rising, and uh, the frog was about to take off. Well, the scorpion obviously can't swim, so he said, hey, you mind if I hop on your back and take a ride? And the frog, knowing that the scorpion would sting him, and if he were to sting him, it would kill him, he said, no, can't do that. Uh, and the scorpion reasoned with him, and he said, does it make any sense for me to jump on your back and sting you while you're carrying me? You're my life raft. Um, and the frog said, well, I guess that makes some sense. So he allowed the scorpion to get on his back. And they took off across the river. And whenever they were about halfway across the river, the frog felt the stinging in his back. And uh, he had been, been stung or stuck, whatever a scorpion does. Um, and uh, as he was dying, he was starting to sink. And he asked the scorpion, why did you do that? And the scorpion said, because it's my nature. You know, it's, it's just what I do. I, I couldn't help it. I didn't want to. I'm sorry. You know, now we're both going to perish. Um, the reason I tell this story as Christians, it is not in our nature to sin. It is not in our nature to sin, and we need to remember that. 
you know, it's just not a knock on this phrase. It's prayed a lot. You know, I've probably prayed it myself. People say, forgive us, Father, we are weak and sinful creatures. And from a fleshly perspective, that is certainly true. From a spiritual perspective, it is not true. We give ourselves the idea that we can't help sinning. And we need to kind of overcome that. Realizing that sin is, is our choice. We can resist temptation. God has told us such. And God has made such that we are able to resist these things. Number four, we need to recognize the escape. Now, this is one that we probably often think about. Maybe whenever you're praying, you say, Lord, whenever I am tempted, I pray that I take the avenue of escape that you have provided for me. Verse 13, completing the, 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 the passage, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. God says every time you are tempted, there is an escape hatch. How do we know that? Because God is faithful. Uh, we read that God cannot lie. Uh, he's told us that he will never allow us to be tempted more than what we are able to bear. Now, thinking back to uh, Genesis chapter 39, going back to Jacob, um, uh, whenever he thought that his son was dead, later on, uh, Potter's, Potiphar's wife had taken a liking to Joseph. I'm sure that you guys remember this story. Verse th uh, 7 of, of chapter 39 in Genesis. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph, and she said, lie with me. Let's give it down to verse 10. So it was as she spoke to Joseph day by day, and he did not heed her to lie with her or to be with her. But it happened about that time when Joseph went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand, and he fled and ran outside. Joseph saw the escape hatch, and uh, it was in the route of running away. And that may be what you need to do at times, run away. Uh, before that went down, we read, he said, how can I do this thing and sin against God? He evaluated that situation. And also what we need to do is evaluate situations before we get into them. Uh, think about things. Don't put ourselves in certain scenarios. Um, you know, things that come to mind, obviously, is, is bars, um, being tempted with alcohol, things like that. Just don't be there. And then you won't have that temptation. Um, I know that there are, are men in business that will refuse to have one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with women. You know, it's another thing that's not a bad idea. Just don't even put yourself in that situation. Uh, because we see what happened with Joseph. Uh, and, and, and she ended up, you know, lying on Joseph. And uh, that situation didn't work out for him well physically, right? Because he was cast into prison. Because she conjured up this story. Um, and, and that's okay, because he didn't sin. And we would rather suffer consequences in this life because of the things that we do if it means not sinning. The longer I dwell in a temptation, the more likely I am to give in to that temptation. Again, if you allow it to, to fester, um, more than likely it's going to take hold. So just a, a few things here. I've got five ways to avoid temptation. Obviously, these are not all, um, but some things to think about to make sure that we don't fall into uh, temptation. Number one, choose your friends wisely. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. I'm sure we're all familiar with this. Evil companions corrupt good morals. Spend time with those that have common goals of pursuing righteousness. Avoid trouble spots. You know, we mentioned bars, clubs, casinos, all of these things. Prepare in advance to not allow yourself to be caught in a situation of potential failure. Run, if necessary, as Joseph did. Um, we mentioned that Potiphar's wife said that Joseph was the one that made advances onto her. This resulted in him being arrested and thrown into prison. Um, you know, and ultimately, even though he suffered that for a, a, a period um, his righteousness prevailed once again, even in prison. Uh, number four, memorize scripture. 
Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. Let's take a look at that one. It's very important. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. Really 10 through 20, this whole section is good. We'll just look at uh, 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Uh, just as Jesus did whenever he was tempted, as we mentioned, it is written, it is written. If we have these scriptures um, imprinted on our hearts, it will certainly help us. Uh, number five, no excuses. Um, James chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. We'll look at uh, Romans chapter 6 one more time. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Um, God wants us to resist temptation. And because of that, he has given us the tools to overcome temptation. It should come as no surprise that God has given us the tools that we need to overcome temptation because he always gives us what we need, including his own son. These things we discussed are only available to those that are Christians, those that have been baptized for the remission of sins. Um, if you have not been baptized, then you are outside of Christ. You do not have an advocate with the Father as those in Christ do. Uh, 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Um, you know, we do sin, unfortunately. Scripture tells us that. Um, but we have a benefit of the Father. Whenever we do sin, uh, we can be forgiven of those things. God has his hand outstretched. Will you grab it? For those that have been baptized, have you struggled in overcoming temptation? Have you fallen into sin? 1 Timothy 6.10 talks about that love of money. Um, and it results in being pierced with many sorrows. And that is what all sin does. It pierces you with sorrows. pierces you with griefs. We have an opportunity to confess and remove the grief and sorrow. And better yet, reclaim life eternal. Um, if there's anybody that needs to respond... Uh, to the invitation, there's no better time uh, than the present. Please come forward as we stand and sing this song of invitation. <clears throat>